it's a distracting um, All right. shift, in, shift in backgrounds. So here you have more of a plane. It's recording now, so I'll mute myself and you're on. Okay, well, thank you, Dave. Um, so today we're doing this, um, this little midge, which is starting to add um, wings to our flies. So this, this style of wing, then Dave is gonna follow up with the, with the coachman style fly. And then we're going to do more things with wings, uh, substituting different materials for these wings. So this first one is supposed to be a fairly simple thing. It's uh, just a little black midge. And uh, I guess, you know, from, from what we know about trout and midges, the adult stage is kind of the least important uh, midge wise. But at the same time, this is a fairly, fairly generic uh, looking pattern, right? So black body, black hackle, and just a fluff of white um, for a wing. Um, some of you here in the audience would recognize that uh, this thing with just a few tiny little changes becomes a CFF, among other things. So here we are, it's, it's good practice in, in getting the wing and the hack along without uh, creating, a, creating a mess. And I'm going to be very uh, brave today and I'm magnifying this big time. It's a size 16 hook. Um, and this one is um, a light wire emerger hook, which I tend to prefer to standard dry fly hooks when I go to smaller sizes. So you can, you can do basically a, a size 18 fly on this. And this one is a Daiichi 1130. Uh, TMCO makes one like this, it's the 2487. It's an awful lot more expensive. I think Togans has um, an emerger hook as well at probably half the price. I don't have any of those, but uh, they, look, they look pretty nice in pictures. Okay, so standard uh, standard stuff. Otherwise, uh, a dot thread in black. This is uni thread, and now this is all a curved hook. So you kind of go to where your thread hangs near the point of the barb. And then I use some black dubbing and I have here something called diamond dub, which is supposedly black, but has this reflections that are in a, in a bluish tone. So you can go with a plain black, super fine. You can go with the sparkly stuff. I have some other Antron that's got a little bit of a greenish, greenish tinge. Um, today I like this, I like this blue blue color. So just a super tiny amount of, of dubbing really. Uh, we've got a really short length of shank to work with. And this is supposed to be a small fly. And it's extremely easy to end up crowding the front of the hook. So that is my main concern here is to wrap the body so that I leave enough room here for wing and everything. And as you can see, it's just basically a little bit more than, than half of what I covered in thread. So I'm going to leave myself here room to put on the wing. Now the wing is just basic, basic uh, polypropylene yarn in white. And I've already cut a little piece of it. So I have this, which is way too much. So the challenge here is to sort of separate these this strands. So this is just like a blob of, of fluff really. And, you know, you have to, to tie a few flies until you kind of guesstimate what is the, what is the amount of, of wing that you really want. You don't want to have too much. And I'm going to trim the end that I'm gonna tie in ahead of time. I'm going to put that down here a little bit more towards my side, do a soft wrap and attach this then 
with a few tight wraps going backwards. Okay. So this is, this is the wing on. Now it's still a bit of a mess. All I'm going to do is I'm just going to trim off the back end of it. And now I'm going to take a hackle, which is a black, black rooster hackle. So I have a, I happen to have a, a whole skin. If you have a saddle, that's a lot nicer and easier, but it's also quite a, quite a pricey, pricey affair. So what I normally do with the, with, with the hackle when, before I attach it is I, I don't know if it's easily visible here. Maybe I'll just move it so you can see. I just trim with the scissors a tiny little bit at the front and leave a few of those stubs for the thread to grab on. And this way I don't have to double back or, or do any other, any other things. Usually the hackles don't, don't come out. They get wrecked in different other ways, but not by, by coming off at this, at this stage. And then hackle pliers. This is the non-rotating version of the, of the Tiemco hackle pliers. Just first wrap nice and tight right up against the wing. I just left enough there for the for the first turn to be mostly bare stem. Two turns, three turns is gonna give you enough hackle here. So when you come to the third turn, take the thread. Whoops. Okay. Slipped. I have to go back. Okay. So there we go again. One turn, two turns, three turns. I seem to be doing it today. Hmm. Okay. Now this I I damaged the hackle beyond any sort of usefulness. I'm just going to remove it. And I'm going to take another hackle that's sitting here prepared. This is shiny side towards me. Secure again. Okay. One wrap. Two wraps. Three wraps. Okay. A couple of turns of thread to secure the hackle in place. Cut. And then if the if the fibers are sticking out at a bit of an angle, you just push back a little bit. And tidy up the head of the fly. I see here reluctant fiber sticking out, so that's going to be easily trimmed at this point. Once you're satisfied with that, whip finisher. Once. Twice. Trim the thread above as usual. And then trim any other fibers that are sticking in 
odd directions and so on. And that's all there is to this fly. You can vary this. You can start attaching tails to this. I fished for a year, for years, um, a fly without a wing that just had a, a peacock body, black tail, and and black hackle, and it was a pretty good uh, fly on lakes. Um, and then I've I've seen that there's something called a Stauffer special. I think that's pretty much along those ideas, and it's supposed to be fished as a as a kind of a beetle wet fly. You cast upstream and and you retrieve. Um, downstream, so sort of kind of the, the same idea as for the steward spider, okay? So anyway, the once you, you start down the slippery slope, there, there are lots and lots of, of ideas um, stemming from this one. Any, um, any questions? That's it, that's, that's, all the, that's all the tying I'm gonna do. Good stuff. Uh, uh, I'm going to do today. Um, before I leave you, though, I'm going to do one more little thing because we kind of had a little bit of a conversation about this last time. And I, whoops, I was going to, uh, there you go. want any any zooming so these are the hackle players that that broke my hackle a couple of times um but that's not what i was uh what i was going to do i'm just going to remove this so this is the the, the fuzzy stuff that i sometimes use as a use as a background and here's my tool caddy made out of a piece of fence post when we had the fence done a few years ago. So it's really nice. It's a beautiful, um, beautiful cedar. So I, I took it and I'm like, oh, this is really nice stuff, right? So I just, uh, I drilled some holes. It doesn't have as much room as, as Dave's does. Um, but it's, you know, it's enough to put, a, to put a basic set of tools. So if you're prepared for tying a particular pattern, You've got pretty much um, everything you need there. Okay, uh, I was just going to very quickly uh, go over some book stuff. Okay, so we were talking about um, we we're talking about fly tying books, and I was going to mention a few others. So you know, I was I was talking about the the, the Craven book, which has super detailed. Uh, pictures. There's this really ancient one that I have from the hunting and fishing library. Um, I probably need to move this even higher so you can see the thing. Um, and it's, you know, um, it was affordable back then and it's it's got a, a bunch of information and basic instructions. Again, pretty good, pretty good pictures. And I learned a lot of my fly tying out of this book. So this is this is a pretty nice book. Then kind of fancier stuff. And I don't know if you guys have these in the in the club library or not, but this one is a is a pretty good uh, is a pretty good book. So this is the Dictaleur book. It doesn't have uh, the super fancy pictures, but it's got pretty nice uh, pictures and, and explanations. And again, it has pretty good beginner, uh, pretty good beginner information as well on hooks and, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Okay. So again, this is, you know, it's got a nice <clears throat> wet flies, wet fly tying and all of that. So this is another excellent uh, reference. Then I picked up, you know, there are weird places you can get books and it's sometimes hard to resist. There's another one here, which I haven't, which I haven't used much given all the other ones that I have. This one takes a while to actually get into the actual proper 
fly tying, but has like nice little diagrams for you know whip finishing both by hand and and using the tool. Um, so that's another one. And then there's some kind of old classics that are more terse in their in their approach. Um, this one came from a from a used bookstore. This is Dick Stewart's Universal Fly Time Guide. And as you can see, this is a little bit older, only black and black and white photos and some some basic instruction on on how to do basic techniques. And then a series of nicely illustrated uh, fly patterns. Okay, this one is a, is a is a pretty skinny book. It's got only forty eight pages. So if you lean towards the minimalist side, um, this would be a this would be a good one. Then there is Dave Hughes in a similar vein with a skinny skinny book. Um, again, black and white um, has all the basic instruction on on doing all the simple steps. And again, I can recommend this for the for the minimalist crowd. It's very nice. And then there are some specialty books which I again collected over time. This one, our club, for some reason, was getting rid of. And uh, Steve, especially for you, this is relevant. You ought to have a book like this if you're at Penn State. So George Harvey was the guy who started a fly fishing course at Penn State. And I think to this day, it's probably the only fly fishing class you can take at a university for credit. Um, and so this is uh, a book that covers both fishing and fly tying for trout. And um, given the amount of material it covers, it's a pretty compact and, and skinny thing. It's a hundred, it's less than 120, less than 120 pages. And it's, it has basically no pictures. It's just illustrations, but it's uh, both interesting historically and it's still useful in terms of seeing how things are done. And then BC wise, um, I lived in BC for a short period of time before moving to Edmonton. So I got this, uh, this classic of, of Jack Shaw's, which- We have of, that book in our club. Yeah, it is- The only one I've seen, yeah. This is a terrific, uh, it's a terrific book. And, you know, everybody, um, refers to to Brian Chan and Phil Rowley these days but uh, before these guys there was Jack Shaw and so when we talk about chironomid fishing this is uh, this is the man really and then perhaps a little lesser known um, Haig Brown himself had a had a fly fishing instruction book that I didn't know about until I chanced upon browsing um, browsing in a in a bookstore and so it's um, it's some stuff about materials and things and um, knots and all the things you need to know about um, about fly fishing and it has a little bit of stuff on uh, on flies at the end so it's not it's not so much about fly tying this is more uh, more fly fishing, but you know, being Hey Brown is is very nicely written, and it's got always useful bits of uh, information. So I don't know if you guys have this one in the library. Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. So um, you know, those of you who haven't checked out these books from the library, I guess it's uh, kind of <laughs> wet wet your your appetite. And then, by way of comparison, the the ones I mentioned last time was the um, Dave Hughes for wet flies, which is probably easier to get than the Roger Fogg book that I was referencing. Um, this one has both the fishing and the, and the tying of the flies. And the instructions are 
reasonably reasonably detailed. They're, they're photographs, they're black and white. So they're nice and clear and it covers all the essential points and has a bunch of plates at the end with, um, with fly patterns, okay? Including, you know, English classics like the uh, Stuart black spider here, for example. So I have, you know, bookmarks here for, for the various, for the various patterns. Okay. So you can, uh, you can go down this rabbit hole. I'm sure there, there are way more uh, fly tying books. And um, as I said, the reason I was um, attracted to that, that Craven book is that it has tremendously detailed illustrations um, and very kind of hold your hand type instructions for, for beginners. So when I want to perfect a technique, I kind of look there. And I also look at um, Davy Mc McPhail videos, which probably some of you do as well. I don't get much of his uh, Scottish. Uh, it's sometimes- It's unintelligible half of it. <laughs> some of it is, is quite mumbly. I was thinking the other day that sometimes you don't know if he's speaking Scottish or he's speaking Danish, which is also uh, the Danes themselves are very proud of. Uh, it's a very mumbly, mumbly language, but you can learn a lot of technique from just watching. Okay. Some of those videos are actually worth pausing and watching little segments again, because he doesn't always say it, but he does things that are worth kind of unraveling and working out exactly why does it come out so neat. Um, so these are the, the various various tricks. And as you can see from my own tying, I'm not very good at following all of these, uh, all of this instruction, but I guess it just needs more practice. Anyway, with that, Dave, back okay. to you. All right, we'll, uh, we'll start working on a little history lesson to start with. So the, the flies I'm going to fly I'm going to tie today is a Western coachman, but it has its origins way back. And we're talking about a Welsh, uh, originally a Welsh fly that it was, I've, I've noted in the notes, it's called the Cocky Bondu, which is, it's spelled C-O-C-H-Y and it's pronounced cock. And it's from, and the Bondu is, is a, the name of a particular uh, hen hackle that we now call a furnace hackle. And there's been notes of this pattern back as far as the late 1700s. And, and all it is, is a little peacock curl on a short shank hook with a furnace hackle on the front. That was the basic pattern. It got developed a little further, a little later on. Somebody got, wanted to glitz it up a little bit. So we ended up with, let me just get this up. Very similar to the Cocky Bondu. Um, is the is another wet uh, wet fly the uh, peacock and starling, which I did a few months ago. I think the it's just the body of uh, of peacock and the and the starling something, hackle. Something happened there. Lost my video for a minute. Um, there we go. So this one has this one has a uh, a gold uh, some. So this one's got a gold butt and a gold rib. And then uh, somebody went and decided that they were gonna at, at make it look a little better. So they, they made what, what they called the coachman. And the fellow was uh, Tom Bosworth. And that was in 1830. And he actually was a coachman for royalty. Uh, and, and he originally did what we now call the coachman, which had white duck quill wings, but later developed it into this version, which has gray duck quill wings. 
And that one is known as the lead wing coachman. Now, uh, the, about 1878, a fellow by the name of John Halley decided that he was going to make it a little fancier. So he ended up putting on, now this is basically what we're going to tie today, uh, later. He decided that he was going to take the regular coachman and he was going to add this mid band red thread to uh and, and i don't know why he did it but he just called it the royal coachman and it originally would have had a lead wing a, a duck quill wing <coughs> and for the material they, they use this stuff for the red which you can't get anymore and i just happen to have a spool of this pearsall's uh, marabou silk uh and it, it's been around for a long time. I probably bought that back in the 60s. Uh, and I just happened to, and the nice thing about the silk, which, which most people don't realize, is that the typical uh, modern silk is a synthetic. And when it gets wet, it doesn't change color. Whereas the marabou silk originally changed color when it got wet, it got darker, almost a brown color. <coughs> So when I get to make Royal Coachman or a coachman of any variety that has that red band, I try to dig out my dwindling supply of marabou silk. Uh, it's not quite as flashy when it gets wet. So the fly we're gonna to tie today is not the, co the Royal version. We're gonna tie the regular coachman, but a Western series. And that goes back to uh, uh, Theodore Gordon back in 1890s, early 1930s, when the Western coachman came about, a fellow by the name of Wayne Buzek in California came up with the Western coachman where he replaced the quill wing with this, uh, with this hair wing. And originally it was calf tail, but uh, in more later years, he went to deer hair because it floated better. Uh, it's more buoyant hollow. So that's what we're going to do today is the uh, Western Coachman with some deer hair. So the first material you use is this stuff. It's, uh, and if you can buy, you can buy little packages of golden pheasant crest, but it's nice to get this one that is actually a small piece of the head of the golden pheasant. And the reason for that is you'll notice that there's different spacing between the black bars, depending on where off this neck you pick the feather. You can get some down here where the black bars are very close together. And then other ones up here where they're actually fairly far apart. And what that allows you to do is that allows you to, to select a feather that has two black bars that stick out the back of the fly uh, to suit the size of the hook you're going to use. So I'm gonna, I've already got one semi-prepared here. So I've taken all the fuzz off the bottom and I'm gonna not pull these fibers straight out to the side. I'm just gonna slightly separate them and then I'm gonna cut them off square so that I keep the tips and the colored black bars lined up. So hook wise, I'm using a fairly hefty hook. It's a Hannock uh, Stillwater wet hook. This is the, the version comes in a standard shank and a long shank and a short shank. This is the uh, standard shank. And I need to buy some more, I'm getting down on them. And I'm tying this in a size 10, mostly because I use a lot of size 10s and 12s for that sort of fly. But the 10 is also a little easier for you guys to see in my arrangement here. I hope you can see that. I need my glasses so I can see. So thread is... Uh, a black A dot. 
And I'm going to uh, start right behind. Now this hook has, has got a slightly down eye and I think that works really well for these particular patterns because when you're tying the hair wing on, it sort of lines up with the eye of the hook quite nicely. So I'm going to start right behind the eye, close that little gap up where the eye is made. And I'm going to wind back here a little bit and trim off. I'm going to run my thread down to about halfway down the hook. And I'm going to take my section of golden pheasant tippet and I'm going to trim it off square right close to the the, the stem, about as close as I can get. And now I've got that those nicely colored barred things nice close together. You can see that. And I'm going to measure against the hook shank. What I want is that the the first bar is right at the bend. That's where I'm going to place it on the hook. Hold it with the left hand, go over the butts of that thing. I'm going to hold it up slightly so I make sure that that tail stays on top of the shank and I'm going to wrap down to and where I'm going to wrap is as far as where the barb would normally be, right where the bend of the hook starts. I'm going to make sure that's good and snug. Now I'm going to spiral my thread back up to about four eye widths behind the eye. The next thing we're going to need is the rib. And the rib is a fine gold wire. Now this is an, actually an extra fine. Um, and I'm going to take that off the spool. And I'm going to take, uh, take the wire and lay it down on the hook, right on top, wrap over top, and then I'm going to wrap back down the hook shank, all the way down to where I wrapped in the golden pheasant tip, right where the previous furthest back wraps are. That's going to be my rib. Get that out of the way. And the next material is this stuff, which is pheasant, uh, peacock curl. And this, I'm going to try and select out of here, uh, for this size hook, about three strands of fairly fuzzy peacock curl. I'm going to see where it's reasonably fuzzy at the tip there. I'm going to line the tips up and not right at the very tip because it's a little fine. The, the stem is a little fine right at the tip. So a little bit back from the very tip. And I'm going to trim them off about a quarter, eighth, eighth of an inch shy of where I'm holding in between my thumb and forefinger. Going to bring my thread back up to that point again where I'm about four eye widths, three to four eye widths back of the eye. I'm going to set that down on the top, make a couple of wraps, not too tight, and then just pull the non-cut end back so I don't have to trim it. And then I'm going to wrap over that again all the way back down. You don't mind building some bulk up in the body of this. It's going to be fished mostly as a wet fly or at least as one that will alternate as a dry and a wet. I'm going to get right back to where the feathers are tied in for the tail and also where the wire is in. And I'm going to wrap clockwise over the thread, loose wraps on the thread all the way around, not too tight a wrap against the thread and fairly well spaced down the thread. You can see I'm making them not too tight together because I don't want to have the, the hurl fibers compacted when I wrap forward. Now I have a rotary vise, so I'm going to wrap with the rotary feature. I'm going to make as nice a body as I can, nice and even with lots of fuzz sticking out. And that may require me sometimes to go back a little bit over top 
and sometimes just straight. So I'm going to wrap this up and if I get close to where it's not wrapped around the thread anymore, I'm going to make a couple more little wraps around the thread. Again, not tight, trying to keep that peacock curl being quite fuzzy. The purpose of having it wrapped around the thread is to make it more durable. Now again, I'm not going to come any further forward than about three to four eye widths behind the eye of the hook. I'm going to unwrap the last one around the thread, hold it up. And I, the reason I'm not wrapping further forward than that is I need space between the hackle and the eye in order to finish the head. So I pulled, pulled that back and wrapped up it in front as well as behind. Trimmed it off nice and tight. And then I'm gonna take my uh, wire and I'm going to wrap the opposite direction around the peacock curl. And I'm going to open spiral it forward, wiggling the wire a little bit so it doesn't mat down the curl. And I'm gonna make three or maybe four wraps until I get to where I'm at, the thread is at. Again, two or three wraps over that. And then two or three wraps in front. And then I can probably just break this guy off like that by doing the helicopter thing. And the next thing I'm going to need is a hackle. This is my hackle. You see, it's not a high quality neck. It's more like a hen hackle. Uh, it's a little longer. So it's not a really high quality hackle. And what I'm gonna do is I, I want the longer portions. This is, these feathers are fairly tapered. When they get these cheaper necks, they're, they're tapered. They're, they're quite wide at the base and narrow at the tips. And the base ones are quite soft, whereas the tip ones are stiffer. And I wanna work with the base ones and I'm gonna measure it up against the hook. I want the fibers to be just a little bit past the distance between the point and the shank of the hook. So I'm gonna take that guy out of there and I'm gonna come in with my fingers and pull off the fuzzy gray stuff at the bottom. I don't need that. And then what I'm going to do, I'm tying, going to tie this in backwards to the way you'd normally tie a hackle because I want to use primarily the long fibers that are here at the back end of the, the feather now that the fuzz is gone. And I'm going to take probably three eighths of an inch of this feather that's maybe the, the width, the length of the body. Not much more than that. I'm only gonna need like three or four wraps of hackle. So I'm gonna stand them out with my fingers and thumb at right angles to the stem and pull them back. So I've got this little gap between the, the front and the back. And I'm gonna lay that down so that that little gap is right where my thread is hanging. And I'm gonna lay it down with the colored side, the intensely colored side facing me at about a 45 degree angle. And then I'm gonna wrap my thread in that little V there, two, three wraps. I'm gonna stand the tag end up, pull it back and I'm gonna wrap in front of it, three wraps. What that does is that locks that feather in so it's not gonna pull out. I'm gonna come in with my scissors and snip the tip off. I'm not gonna discard the tip. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna just peel a little bit of fibers off the end so I leave that little bare end and I'll show you what that's for later. And I take my alpha pliers. And I'm going to grab the stem of the sackle now. And this is this technique is, is a called a folded hackle technique. 
So I'm going to hold it up and I'm going to wet my thumb and forefingers and I'm going to keep some tension on that and I'm going to stroke the fibers up towards the back of the hook so they fold around the stem. And then I'm going to start wrapping the hackle around the shank. I'm going to make sure when it goes underneath that I get those fibers clear and they go backwards. Two. And now I'm coming up on the third one. Again, all those fibers are stripped to the back. And I'm going to wrap over the behind in that V that the stem makes with the hook. Two or three there. And then I'm going to wrap in front. One, two, three. And then I'm going to trim out the stem. You see, I got a couple little mallards that are sticking out here. There's a few little fibers that stick out. I'm going to come and just trim those off so they're not in the way. Now I'm going to make sure that this hackle is to the back. So I'm going to wrap backwards over top of the wrap in point of the hackle just a little bit to force them facing backwards. A couple of good wraps there. Now you see I've got lots of room here in front. I've got a good eye width between the back of the eye and the front of the hackle. I'm just going to make sure I've got a good width there. Now the last piece of material is this stuff, which is the fine deer hair. It's uh, this, this stuff that I really like. It's the X caddis deer hair. It's for doing these small flies. The one I used the last time. And this one, I couldn't get any white, but I got the, the whitest, blondest bleached version. It's the uh, bleached one. And I'm going to snip out a small bit of deer hair out of this. And that's not going to be a whole lot. I'm going to go in here and pick out a chunk, trim it off close to the hide. And then I'm going to hold it by the tips, my left hand, and pull out all the loose fibers from the front, the base of the hair. And I'm going to look and see how much I've got. That's a little too much. So I'm just going to pull out a few fibers from this bunch. I want the wing relatively sparse. That should do it. And I noticed that it's got a little curve to it. So I'm going to try and get the curve towards the back. I'm going to measure this hackle so that the wing comes back to just about where that second black mark is, a little bit behind the bend of the hook, about halfway down the tail. And I'm going to swap hands. And I'm going to lay this down on the hook and I'm going to trim it right at the front of the eye. So I'm going to trim it really short and straight across, about a sixteenth of an inch sticking out. And I'm going to set that down right on the top of the hook between the eye and the hackle. And I'm going to wrap over top with a loose wrap and I'm going to bring it all the way around and then I'm going to pull up. I'm going to do that again, pull up. And then I'm going to wrap all these little stubby bits down with thread. Now these flies, these all of these flies that I showed you and this one, they all have a fairly prominent black head. I think that's part of the design of the flies is to have a fairly prominent head. So I'm going to make lots of wraps. This is eight dot thread, so it will take quite a few wraps. And there's my nice prominent black head. And I'm just going to make the last couple of wraps towards the back fairly loose. I'm not going to make them tight because I don't want to flare the hair too much. I'm going to tie my whip finish and I, I like to do it with my fingers because I can place that thread fairly well with my fingers. 
Matarali, I'm not as good at placing the wrap of thread precisely where I want it. And then a second finish. Take her down. And I don't need to cut. I just bring the edge of my scissors in and touch the thread right up against the head of the hook. And there it goes. Now, the last thing I'm going to do before I cement this is I'm going to look at where the, the wing is. And it tends, it's tended to go down the side of the hook a little bit, which is more than what I want. So I'm going to come in here with my bodkin and I'm going to pick four or five uh, hair fibers that are down the side that so the peacock curl shows. I'm going to stand them out at right angles to the hook, get them straight out. I'm going to take my tweezers and I'm going to go right down to the thread and I'm going to grab them and I'm going to break them off. It's Breaking them off is easier than trying to, uh oh, last whip finish came undone. So half hitch time, must have nicked it with my scissors. I'll get this, uh, it, this will be cemented, so I'm not too worried about coming completely undone. But a couple or three half hitches will secure it for the time being. And the near, near side is okay. So it's just a few feathered. Can I take my Sally Hansen's hard as nails? Because all these flies tend to have a, a shiny head. And I'm going to just dab some stuff on there to make enough glue to hold the head together and shiny. And of course, what happens when you do that, you end up with a little bit of glue going into the eye of the hook. And that's where the, uh, oops, that's where the leftover end of the hackle comes in handy. Because I take the stem of the hackle and I stick it through the eye of the hook and pull the hackle through the eye. And that removes all the glue so your eye isn't gummed up. And that's him. Dave, if you don't use the um, the uh, hair on the back, would it turn into a white fly, into a wet fly? Um, Without the wing? Yeah, well, the, the trick with, that's why they use the duck quill wings, because the duck quill wings don't float well, and, and so a standard English wet is, is like the, that lead wing coachman I showed you, um, which, has, which has the wings like that on the sides, you see? Yeah, and that's, I can see that that's a traditional problem. wet fly. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good caddis imitation okay. for the emerging caddis. These ones are fished more as a, as a dry fly, although the way I, I use them, I use them both as, as a combination dry and wet. I'll, I'll cast it out. As, and let it float as a dry fly. And then as it, as it floats down river a little bit or downstream a little bit and the line tightens up, then I'll give it a tug and it'll sink just below the surface. And uh, I've had, I've caught lots of grayling particularly with that technique, fishing it in a current seam and let it float through the current seam. And then just as your line gets tight, just give it a tug and it goes under and then swing it a bit. And quite often they'll take it as soon as it goes under. And sometimes they'll take it Actually, when it's you're, you're sort of fishing it in the seam downstream of your leg, <laughs> that's another trick. <laughs> hey, uh, Dave, I've yeah. got a question for you about the golden pheasant tippet. Yep. Um, I see that golden pheasant tippet on all kinds of different flies. What what do you think it's imitating or trying to imitate? I don't know. That's a good question. It could be the trailing shock on a wet fly. Yeah, I thought maybe. Or yeah. a merger. Yeah. 
I, I, I think it just adds a little bit of flash and color. It's the same reason as to, you know, a lot of, a lot of guys tie uh, flies with a bit of a red tag on them. Yeah. Uh, and again, with coronamids, you know that that's, that's pretty common with emerging coronamids is that they have the butt end of them are a little red. They still have a little hemoglobin left. But I think it's just something that the fish, it's an attractor. It's a, what they call a hot spot almost. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect that it's just, it's, it attracts the fish to something other than the natural. It looks like a natural, but it looks like it might be more edible, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, yeah. It's used you, a lot. You see it You're... on some of these, um, a lot of those fancy English Atlantic salmon flies. Too. Yeah, a lot of salmon flies. Even the West Coast ones for for uh, for uh, cutthroat. Like a lot of those, those have, uh, and they'll use not just the uh, not just the pheasant crest portion, wherever mine went. Um, they use the. There's some gold curved fibers on this neck that they use. Um, and I'll show you what that here. They this use this. They refer to as topping. Topping, they use this material as topping, yeah. And and so, you know, golden, you're better off if you're gonna buy a golden pheasant, if you've got the money, go buy the whole darn skin because there's all kinds of fibers uh, and, and, fly, and feathers on a golden pheasant for all kinds of flies. And, and you'll, you know, you buy a skin and you'll never use it all, <laughs> but you'll use parts of it all, all over. Yeah. Golden pheasants uh, are really good. It's, it's in a lot of patterns and uh, it has, I think that these pheasant fibers, they, they, they have a bit of a sheen to them too. So maybe it picks up a little sheen and looks like, you know, trailing bubbles or something. I don't know. It's mm -hmm. it's effective. Yeah. yeah. The, the, you know, oh, and the last one, of course, is is the royal coachman, and this is the one with the hair wing. Uh, in in the version, and and all the royal coachmen have that that tail, right? Yeah. Whether it's the dry yeah. fly or the parachute or whatever, it's that tail. Yeah. Babe, it's not that expensive. I mean, I bought this at Robinson's. It's an entire. Yeah. Uh, golden pheasant skin it was like 18 bucks yeah yeah and and, and, I think, and you can see how much usable kinds of feathers there are in that skin well, there's tons, yeah yeah I, I think though way back when a lot of these flies were developed golden pheasant was quite common if you look at yeah. the new developed fly patterns you don't see that yeah most of these are way back in the you know prior to the 80s yes yeah. Well, back back in eighties, as in 1880. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah, a lot of those patterns go back that far, right? And I think it was because there's a great supply of them from India. Yeah, yeah, oh, and, yeah. And India yeah, was that... a colony of Britain. Yeah, but it, it's it's also very very colorful and 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 brilliant. And in fact, the um, the, the pheasant tail from the golden. <laughs> Pheasant, right? The uh, oh, yeah. this this is terrific, uh, terrific nymph nymph material. Yes, you get a you know if you use standard pheasant tail, you end up with the um, kind of a reddish reddish brown, and it's fairly uniform in color. Whereas or this one, this one is black more. effect. This stuff you just and some of these fibers are very long. Yeah. You, you can get, you know, the whole fly title of just a small clump of fibers. Yeah, yeah. and the, and a and lot of the Atlantic model. salmon flies have that golden neck feather. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's it. Well, thank you, Dave. No problem. <laughs> we'll stop the recording.